Hello and welcome to an Infinity the Game Battle Report. Today we're playing Dash Out Company vs. Starmada, and the scenario is Supremacy. Now, firstly, big thanks to my opponent for this game, Sam. Sam is not a Canberra local, he's actually travelling down the Australian Eastern Seaboard all the way from Darwin on his way to Albury on the New South Wales Victoria border. There's an event coming up in Albury called Border Bash, which Sam is travelling to, as are a number of Canberra locals. And along the way, Sam is stopping off at various places, playing games, and doing, in his own words, a bit of awareness about mental health. Now, this is not a coordinated effort. In his own words, it's very ad hoc. He's just traveling, playing some games, and doing some writing. But you'll find a link to his blog in the pinned comment and video description below. So props to Sam. And of course, big thanks to him for reaching out and asking for a game on his way through Canberra. Now, I'm playing Dash Hat Company in this game, and the reason for that is that in my recent Rama Task Force video, I said that the natural home of the Mangariba is in Dash Hat, and that kind of made me want to go back and actually just play that kind of list again. Dash Hat Company is one of the very few armies that runs so much stuff with such a discount associated with, like, they're just, they are just basement bargain budget prices across the board. And that means that it is very easy to get to 13 or 14 troops in a list and literally have like the only thing that will fill out the remainder of your points to 300 be something like the Magariba. This list is trying to push that to the extreme with the maximum amount of gun and fight and orders and still fit her in. And frankly, it's probably very slightly overdoing it. It could afford to just trim a few pieces of capability back, get the baseline a little bit more solid, because you will see some sacrifices are being made in this list in order to accommodate everything that I want. Nevertheless, what's in the list? This is the first draft and what I played this evening. In the first group, we have six troopers that collectively can form either a core or two three-person links. They play two three-person links in this game. We have the Red Fury MSV-1 Rushi, Zuyong, Takaware, Tenbot, and Valeria Gromos. That would be one link, so we get a Tenbot minus six and a repeater and tactical awareness and a gun to accompany Valera. It's quite useful link. And then a little bit more scuffed, we have a Zuyong, HMG, and two diggers. Now, this is a very cheap assault team, but really it is very cheap. Once the Zuyong goes down, it's just some free-running diggers. They have to have made their way forward at the table to be kind of useful. Frankly, I think you could play this in a much more like cohesive way. And one of those ways, if you're comfortable with a core link, would be to just run this as a five-person core and stick this digger to the Magariba Guard in a duo. Still, that's how I played it today. Two three-person teams, two burst five guns, plenty of like close assault and some hacking. It's basically just useful stuff. For the points cost, you're getting a pretty good deal on all of that. Rounding out the group, we then have McMurrah, who is McMurrah and is excellent. Uh, first of two, Limitism Mind Layer Libertos, a Coom Rider with Light Shotgun and a Ghulam Lieutenant. One of the sacrifices this list makes is that it literally has one legal lieutenant option, and it's the Ghulam. So, that's one of the things that you would consider changing if you wanted to run this in a slightly more sane and conservative way. Combat Group 2, we then have a Fenus Remote and a Tractor Mule. The Fenus Remote is a repeater, the Tractor Mule is baggage alongside the Magriba, so there are two models with baggage in this list. If I wanted to reload mines or more realistically Valeria Gromos's pitches. Now that tractor mule would be a Fenus remote if I thought I could afford it, but I could not find the two points. And one of the things that truck company can do is they can downgrade a seven point model to a five point model and still have a regular order if you think you can deploy it, because of course the tractor mule is on a much larger base. We then have the cheapest Magariba. Ideally, I would take the 85.1. Again, this list is making sacrifices to fit this many big guns and the hacking and the Libertos mines, etc. Ideally, this would be the, the 85 point Magariba, which has a template weapon and the mine dispenser. It's a a lot more going on with her. The 81 point version is is serviceable. Like all my garibas, it's a little too expensive. But this is Dash Out Company, so I can afford it. In this list, though, nevertheless, could only afford the 81 point version. And then we have another Liberto and another Coom Rider. Liberto Mimitism is a mine layer, Coom Rider Light Shotgun. Now, frankly, one of these Coom Riders should probably be turned into a Fenus remote. This list is going hard on the paint in terms of irregulars alongside everything else. It's got five irregular troopers, the two Riders, the two Libertos, and McMurrah. And without anything special in the list like Saladin, which obviously Dashad can't take, that is, that is a lot of irregulars. And it really does impact how the list plays. You can learn to play this list, you can learn to like ride that line. 
I was coming back to dash out, so it was a little awkward. I felt like really those there's all of this tactical awareness, which is good, but tactical awareness, when you spread it out this much, you've got tactical awareness in one team, you've got tactical awareness in another team, you've got tactical awareness on the tag. It tends to result in a very diffuse effort, which you can work with, but you've really got to know how to play that. Because Infinity, typically speaking, we will spend a lot of our orders on just a few pieces. Playing Infinity, like it's some sort of variation of 40k, where everything activates a little bit, is typically less effective. So despite the fact that this list has all of this stuff that can attack and fight and do things in it, it would probably benefit from having just maybe one more regular order rather than those five irregulars. Nevertheless, very fun list. And as a starting point, like this is a proof of concept. It gets a lot of stuff in here. Like this list has got a ton of attackers and two link teams and three tactical awareness orders, including a tag, like etc. It's not, this is, this is a good list. It is just doing a little much. It's spreading itself a bit too thin, but very fun to play. Now, playing against me today, we have Sam's Starmada, and this is an interesting take on Starmada. And by interesting, I mean I have not played against a Starmada list like this. Now, I played Starmada quite a bit, particularly when the Roadbot came out, but my lists were very much focused on the ITS season of the time, the Roadbot and Oka Copperbot duo, the Zeta, etc. And so a lot of the like middleweight stuff in Starmada, I just didn't really explore that much. And this is important because it's going to turn into a little bit of an interesting case study over the course of this game about how Dark Horse advantages in Infinity are kind of real, which is cool. Now, just breaking down what's actually in the list, we have a five-person, pretty much pure defensive Kappa core. So it's one Kappa, one Kappa paramedic, one Kappa missile launcher, and then two Raven Eyes, one of whom is the lieutenant. Now, this list has three specialists in it, and it's got all of these mines, etc. It can do a little bit of work in its turn, maybe pressing a button, maybe laying some mines, but it doesn't really want to move, and ideally it doesn't really want to do anything. Instead, what it's looking to do is push orders through those crushers, which are much more efficient troops. They are durable, they are mimetism, no wind and cap, shock immune, forward deploying gunfighters with scary weapon loadouts and their forward observers, etc. They can do a lot, including like a lot of classifieds. And so the Link wants to spend, all of its orders want to be spent on the Crushers. The Crushers will be the ones that want to actually do everything. The Link is primarily defensive. Now, in an 8 7 or a 7 8 split, that's, that choice relies on the Crushers surviving. But if they do, they can do a ton of work with a good order pull behind them. Meanwhile, in combat to group two, we have a similar number of fairly self-sufficient pieces. We have a three-person team of a beta trooper with Spitfire, Tinbot, Nanobolsa, a Psychop hacker. So this is a BTS-6 hacker with a Tinbot. That's pretty nice. And then Shona Carano for close assault. A Millicent Copperbot, which I will circle back to because I think it's kind of a cool choice in this list, all things considered. A single Varangian, a single Warcore, and then two submachine gun decharge wild parrot forward observer Sarkos. Now, Sarkos are another one of those pieces that when they came out, I looked at them and I thought, wow, that's really cool. And then I just didn't play them at all because I was too busy making brum brum noises and riding robots everywhere. But despite the fact that they're only ballistic skill 11, for 20 points, climbing plus, specialist, wild parrot, submachine, like that's a really, really solid profile for ultimately quite a cheap points cost. And they're going to be doing work in this list. Now, the uh, just circling back to the Millicent Copperbot and why I like it here and I think it's cool. It's only 16 points. The list has the one and a half SWC spare. It's not difficult to include. Now, you look at this list and you think, this list has got zero pitches and a single Whip 13 hacker. Why are we including the Millicent Copperbot? And the answer is, the list has four forward observers. The Crushers are durable, they're forward deploying. And then, of course, the Sarkos have the forward observer under a camouflage marker, which means that you can aggressively move forward with them. And if your opponent attempts to discover you, you can respond with an unopposed forward observer role and then just light them up with missiles. This is borderline Ariadna tech in a Starmada list. And given the relatively low opportunity cost, that's super cool. Now, you know, could we adjust this list to get some sort of more offensive hacking in? Yeah, absolutely. You could shift this more toward kind of on meta, but the list is doing its own thing and it's figured out what it sort of wants to be, and I think that's very cool. Everything in here is in here for a purpose, even if it's very different to the kind of Star Mater list that I would write, where I would put in a Zeta and go, ho, 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 gun. This is playing much more subtly, much more dispersed force. On top of that, it's using a bunch of pieces that I'm not going to be familiar with, so I'm not going to be entirely sure how it plays, and that's going to impact the first turn of the game in particular. 
Now, Sam has one lieutenant role and elected to deploy second on the right side of the table, so I'm deploying first on the left and I've chosen to go first. In terms of deployment, we've put down our QOZ creatures. Sam's is in this building here and mine is behind this nook on the high ground up here. Both of them will get killed by martial artists at some point during the game and not do a great deal, but that's fine, that's their job. Now, for deployment. The Coom Riders are going to be deploying Impetuous, and from bottom to top, we've got the Combat Group 1 Coom Rider, the Haris team of the Rushi, Valeria, Gromoz, and the Zuyong with Tinbot. Uh, on this rooftop, not really intending to move, we have the Baggage Tractor Mule. Optim optimistically, it might end up uh, re reloading one of Gromoz's pitches during the course of the game, but it, it won't. It'll just be there the entire time. It'll climb down later on to get into his own. Over here on this rooftop, we have the link of the Zuyong and two diggers. Now, this is the first part where I make a little bit of a mistake. And this is just a dumb mistake. Sam has been telling me for the last 10 minutes that he's playing Starmada. And I'm going there like, mm hmm, yes, mm hmm, that's the faction with primes and hellblazers. That's the O12 sectoral, yes, mm hmm. Now, this is not smart. This is dumb. This is just me thinking about Torchlight because Torchlight lists have been sent through to me to look at over the past past few days. And so I don't think about the fact that there might be a Kappa core. I'm thinking about mm, probably no hard arrows, probably going to be things like Moonrakers and like a Prime that's waiting until active turn. That's Torchlight Brigade, Rob. That's not, that's not, that's not Starmada. This is Starmada. So I clump these boys here. Uh, and I'm, I am only, only by like sheer dumb luck do I not get them all pasted by a missile on the first turn. Nevertheless, the diggers roll Mimetism 6 and a multi sniper rifle. This is not going to matter basically the entire game, but they are very nice booty rolls. Yeah. Finally, at the sort of top corner here, we have the HVT up here on the 16-inch line, and then McMurra and the second Coom Raider, the Combat Group 2 Coom Raider, uh, hanging out on either side of this tower here. Their goal is to be able to potentially mutually support each other with smoke grenades as they advance. Then we have some Libertos scattered throughout the midfield. So the first Libertos is here. On ground level, we have the mine, and on the rooftop up near the QAZ creature, we have the Libertos itself with shotgun. Uh, and then... In this building and on the other side of it, we have the other Libertos. At ground level in this nook is the mine, the mine layer, sorry, Libertos. And then behind the building, pinching off this approach up the side of the table, is its mine. The Gulam Lieutenant is hanging out in this nook on the very back of the table. And the Magariba Guard will be my reserve drop here, which will make sense when we get into Sam's deployment. Now, for Sam's part, the first thing he does is just slap down his core link in this space here, including the missile launcher. Now, this this piece of terrain we have is is uh, is fascinating. It basically has two silhouette, two sized like trench holes in it. So this uh, <laughs> this missile launcher and this paramedic are like perfectly positioned. I'll never be able to see the paramedic, and the missile launcher has 360 cover. So I kind of can see why Sam chose that deployment zone. The missile launcher has very good lines of fire. It can see sort of down to where this building terminates and it is pinning down. It doesn't have line of sight to, I will, but I will have to stay prone for some time if I want to move this clumped link team out, lest they all get absolutely flogged by a, a burst two ballistic skill 15 missile. Now, of course, the Raven Eyes have also thrown EM mines everywhere, which are going to be a huge problem. Only one model in my entire list, and that's McMurrah, really wants to just tank EM mines. Nothing else does, because even things like the Coom Riders or Libertos, because they are dogged attackers, a lot of their value comes from taking a wound, pushing forward, dealing damage before they finally die. They're very efficient in that respect, but if you get flogged by an EM mine, okay, cool, that's it. That's If you went dogged, you're just going to die at the end of turn. Like, your activation ends because you have no more orders to spend. Yes, you can do some shenanigans by choosing to save their irregular order and keep it for after they go isolated. That is an option, but it's like that is a last resort play if you really need to punch through a defense. So those EM mines are going to be a very significant deterrent, at least during the first turn, until I can engineer a breakthrough. Otherwise, we have the Millicent Copperbot down here watching this very long lane, which is going to be a huge pain in the butt for my poor Rushi, who is the only gun that can otherwise contend it. The HVT is deployed down here. The Warcore is on this rooftop. Uh, and then we have the Beta Trooper team sort of scattered in this position, safely behind this building, able to take a doorway at ground level up onto the rooftop. And of course, the Beta Trooper has Climbing Plus. 
Uh, finally, the Varangian Guard is hanging out down here, and then we have the two crushers. Now, the first crusher is the light rocket launcher, which is deployed standing here, and what it's doing is trying to pin back McMurrah and the biker, which is why I have reserved to drop the Magariba Guard so far back to try and to engage it. And then the other crusher, the reserve drop, has come down here. It's just sort of like watching these close... Well, this is a fairly long line, to be honest, but the otherwise these sort of like closer angles here. And its goal really is to just gut backwards into cover after absorbing some firepower to slow me down. Now, Sam takes orders away from my big combat group, and I hit the gas with impetuous orders. Everything not quite can, say, can impetuous safely, like McMurrah, for example, if he impetuouses, would move around here through line of fire of the crusher. But that's why I've positioned the support biker the way I have. So the biker impetuous is first, and it comes around this way because it can't get past McMurrah, and it throws some smoke down along the side of the building, which then lets McMurrah impetuous around. Uh, and actually, he impetuouses, and then he makes a CC attack and takes out the... doesn't take out, it'll take him his irregular order as well, but he will engage and then ultimately destroy the QAZ creature inside the objective, so inside the, uh, the building here. Likewise, this bike does safely impetuous, but then it just sort of doesn't do anything because if it wants to progress further, it has to contend with this missile launcher in ideal range, range band, and I'm just not prepared to have that fight at this particular time. Now, it's at this juncture that what we would call the dark horse advantage begins to kind of manifest for Sam because I don't really know what's necessarily important in his list. It's not like the Star Martyr list that I would play. I don't have any kind of an experiential advantage in this game, despite the fact that I'm probably a more experienced player than Sam. And what that means is that I basically, I try and fall back on what I expect are probably good things to do. We're going to try and move forward and take some space in supremacy. We're going to try and clean off the things that I think are particularly scary or which I have to engage to progress. And that's going to result in mixed decisions. Some of the decisions I will make will end up being good, although I didn't necessarily know they were good at the time. It was really just sort of like luck slash engaging the things were in front of me. And some of them will be bad because I don't respect all of the things Sam's list can do. And those are the mistakes that you can make when you're playing against something that you're not familiar with. And that this is one of the ways that Infinity almost self-balances to a respect, because if something is generally considered to be like off-meta or not necessarily as strong, fewer people will play it, which will mean that even experienced players won't be as familiar engaging it and more likely to either make mistakes or have to spend more time thinking from first principles, not be able to just fall back on their experience and therefore bear more mental load. Now, the good decision that I will make this turn is to engage the crushers because they are scary. It's not going to be an easy thing to do. These guys are going to prove to be disgustingly resilient. And in fact, Combat Group 2, uh, the Magariba will spend pretty much the entirety of Combat Group 2's orders engaging and destroying this crusher here. Now, this is a good face-to-face -face roll for her. This fight is happening at about 27 inches, which means the Crusher is only hitting on 7s, she's hitting on 11s, but it's a it's a heavy infantry, effectively. It's got the two wounds, and it just passes an ungodly number of saves, and it takes her literally four of the potential six orders she has access to in her combat group to put it down, which means that's it. That's all that combat group is doing. Now, she does kill it. Sam did have the option, and I think probably he should have taken this of at about the third order, he took a wound and elected to hold position to keep McMurrah and the biker back because they hadn't spent any orders at this point. But I do think at that point, he should have cut his losses. Nevertheless, held position, and it took basically the entirety of combat group two for the Magariba to put this one down. Combat Group 1, we're going to be doing a little bit of moving forward, but this is where part of this issue that I have with so many ir irregular models and with tack awareness being spread out across a lot of different places, you, you get a lot of versatility in terms of how you might potentially spend your orders, but it's difficult to focus how you spend your orders. In this case, I decide that I'm going to focus on the small three-person team here, and so they're going to just attempt to do a couple of things. They will move out, and it'll be the Rushi that's going to be doing most of the fighting, and it's mostly them that will be moving out, because if I try and move the HMG team forward, it's just risking having to engage a missile, and I don't particularly want to do that. So the Rushi is going to take two fights. Firstly, it's going to come up and around here, and it will engage and kill Burst 5, Ballistic Skill 12. It will put down the War Correspondent, and then it will move up and around this way, and it will engage the Crusher. And this time, after, I think, a couple of inconclusive fights, it puts the Crusher one wound and forces it. Actually, it drops back to here. So 
runs into this nook to seek total cover. That opens up some space for, there's an objective here, Gromors will press this button, and then the, the, the unit will keep moving up and around this way, allowing the Rushi to pop up onto the roof and then backwards onto, still staying sort of behind these, these billboards here, up onto the higher ground, which gets a line of sight to the crusher to engage and destroy it after one more order. Now this is going to leave the Rushi kind of exposed on the roof here, but it's at a line of fire of the missile launcher and the other two members of the link will go prone behind this garden bed. Now, as far as first turns go, that's not necessarily that bad, but I am cognizant that I'm playing Supremacy and I don't want Sam to be able to just bum rush into zones and start scoring. So I make, I make the mistake of this turn which is, or the, the most significant mistake, which is that I spend the tack aware order on this link team. I keep them prone and I just move, move. I just move, move most of them up onto this bridge so that they're in the objective zone. What I should have done is, yes, spend the tack aware order, but just move the two diggers forward prone on this rooftop and left them in that position for now, not gone any further. And the reason why is that I have been fixated on these crushers as firstly, they are the model in range, in reach. I can, I can attack them, so I have been attacking them. But secondly, I'm scared of the threat that they pose. What I have done is not think about what other models Sam might have and what mobility skills he might have, because as his turn begins, he just starts spending orders through that beta trooper. It's got climbing plus, it just cleanly comes up onto this rooftop while the rest of the link follows behind, and then it walks along here and it just shoots everything down this line over the course of a few firefights. And that means that it puts the Rushi down, uh, and then it puts a wound on the sniper-armed digger, which forces it back into cover, and then it engages and destroys, yes, at long range, but he has me out of cover, engages and destroys the Zuyong. Now, this takes him a few orders, but he doesn't take any casualties, and he effectively comfortably equalizes the damage that I did during the first turn. I killed two crushers, he's killed basically two of my three big guns, which means that it's pretty much just down to the Magariba who was in combat group two to be the gunfighter for the entire rest of this game. Now, fortunately, I have three gunfighters. There's a bit of redundancy in the list, but these were a lot of casualties on the first turn. And it's it's literally only the fact that Gromos has pushed a button that has me a head-on scenario at the moment. Now, the upside of this entire turn for me is that my decision to kill the two crushers is paying big dividends otherwise, because they were the models that wanted to spend all of the orders on the five-person Kappa link. With the crushers down, the Kappa just have to spend their orders themselves, and they're not super comfortable doing that. They'll move around a little bit, they'll move out, they'll push some buttons or try and fail to push some buttons, they'll lay some mines and they'll pull back, but it's not a hugely efficient turn. Otherwise, we just have uh, this Sarko here, attempt to push the button, moving out this way, fail, and then just re-camouflage in order to be safe. So that sort of puts us in this position here as we begin my second turn, and we can see the destruction that this beta trooper has wreaked. Not only that, but Sam has made the judgment call, and he's absolutely correct, that he can just leave the beta trooper standing because the only gun that I have that might engage it has relatively few orders and it's a very long way away. If that Magariba wanted to engage the beta trooper, it would need to either pull all the way back to here, or it would need to jump up onto that rooftop, neither of which it necessarily has the orders to do efficiently. And so, between the overlapping fire from the Millicent, which is watching this line, and then the Spitfire, which has got basically the entirety of the midfield pinned to down, Sam has put a huge amount of my force on lock in addition to scoring a bunch of kills and making sure the scenario round by round scoring stays equal. So very strong, like clean turn one play especially off the back of basically how dice rolls have gone, how long it's taken me to kill certain things, Sam's armor rolls, etc. over the course of this game, part of which is going to continue into this second turn. Now, I am going to be bailed out, as Dash Hat Company often is, by Leroy Jenkins Tactics and Bugmara. So there is going to be a three-pronged attack basically up this part of the table on this turn, split across both combat groups, both combat groups doing work here. And they are going to do work, and this is kind of the attack that Dash Hat can launch, particularly once it's staged some assets, so that it doesn't have to spend too many orders moving in a turn, which is important because it's got all of these irregulars, only relatively few irregulars. It's sort of, it's spread out. It's got to be able to spend those, not small order pools, because they're large order pools, but those diffuse order pools efficiently. So the attack is going to come in three different paths. The first is that we're going to have the biker. So the, in Impetuous, the same thing will happen, where we will have mutually supporting smoke grenades, and McMurray will get some smoke down here. And then the biker will come out and around occupying that smoke. McMurray will then move forward, not to leave the smoke, but to 
bleed, sort of like move to the edge of the smoke, then back at a different angle to safely detonate an EM mine. Ultimately, this is going to end up not mattering, but it is just a best practice. And then the biker is going to charge out of the smoke, putting a double shotgun template down on the missile launcher. Now, terrible news, the missile launcher will make both saved, which is a huge pain. It is, it is unlikely for that to happen. She needs to roll 13s to pass uh, on two separate dice, but she does, and between her and the combi rifle that is now on ARO, they put the biker all the way down to dead. I came very close to just going dogged, which would have allowed me, because the EM mine had been cleared, would have allowed me to attack one more time, but in this case she goes down cleanly. Not to worry, we have reserves, as this Libertos here comes out and around. Now, along the way, he's going to decline to ARO with the Sarko, and the... Missile launcher is going to declare a discover at about 16 inches, which the Robotos will respond with just by shooting the shotgun, and I will hit and this time finally put the missile launcher down. It's then going to continue to walk out and around this way, and it will shotgun down the Kappa standing up, and that will open up the option for McMurra to begin a secondary attack. So McMurra then moves out and around this way. So this, this Libertos that was doing all of this work was the Combat Group 2 Libertos, so it's been the Combat Group 2 Kum Raider and the Combat Group 2 Libertos that have spent basically all of the orders in that Combat Group. Now McMurra is free and clear to attack. Along the way, he attempts to discover the Sarko, fail, the Sarko will later reveal to shoot him, he will chain rifle it down, and he will just bounce his way through this entire link. Uh, he will move into close combat. There are EM mines everywhere, by the way, but McMurray is the only piece in my army that doesn't care about that, thanks to total immunity. And so he will jump onto this Raven Eye, kill it in close combat, jump up into this Raven Eye, kill it into close combat, jump back and past to see the paramedic. Uh, she will just shoot to try and put him down, and he will chain rifle her to death. And so that's going to mean that at the end of this turn, even though I have been totally unable to deal with this beta trooper link, which is still pinning down my forces, I have managed to put down this Sarko and then all of these five pieces. And that includes both of Sam's possible LT, well, all three of Sam's possible LT options. I actually have assumed that it's one of the Raven Eyes, not the Kappa that he has put on ARO duty, and indeed that has been the case. And so this means that not only is Sam's second combat or first combat group completely gone, he's now just down to the Harry's team, but he's in loss of lieutenant. And that means that the ability he has to punch back on this turn, maybe seize space in this part of the table, is going to be very diminished. He's going to have a game crack at it. And he sort of said after the game, and this is where this is where the Dark Horse sort of thing goes both ways. Dark Horse advantage relies on you having at least equal sort of like or solid knowledge of the game. And it's just been a long time since he's played against McMurray. He just didn't think about total immunity and the fact that it let McMurray punch through EM mines. And so he thought he was a lot safer and his defensive position was a lot stronger on that right flank than it actually was. And this is the case, like being, having, playing a list that is a little off meta can incent your opponent or push your opponent into a position where they make mistakes, but it doesn't make you immune to making mistakes either. And this was a case where Sam, for all that I wasn't sure necessarily how to handle the crushes and that link team, and I didn't respect the damage that link team could do, Sam just didn't think, he just sort of spaced on the fact that McMara could punch through those EM mines like they were literally nothing, because to him they were. And so it's resulted in catastrophic failure for poor Sam. And while he's going to do his level best to recover, there just really isn't enough for him to do so. He's going to make a very game play, though. So basically, all of the command tokens that he's had are going to be spent with this link trying to seize territory. Uh, Shona Karano is going to move up over this, this bridge to take out the QAZ creature. The Beta Trooper is going to move out and around this way to try and seize this territory along with Shona. The Psychot will stay back where it is. And the Varengian Guard will move forward. He can't safely engage McMurra. Uh, McMurra still has both wounds at this point, but he will move up and around here just to threaten various different things in this part of the table. Now, the big play here is trying to keep the score even, leaving the Psychop back in this otherwise uncontested zone, and hope that this Sarko, when it moves forward, and Shona and the Beta Trooper are enough to bomb out the points in this zone here, and score Sam that zone, which will mean that Sam scores this zone and this zone, and I score this zone and this zone. But unfortunately, in this zone here, I have, even though the Rushi is dead, I have a Libertos, I have the Biker, I have Valeria Gromoz, I have the Tinbot Zuyong, and between all of those pieces, and there might even have been something else, that's enough for me to secure that zone, which means that I score three zones this turn to Sam's two, which puts me two points ahead in addition to the one button that I have pressed. 
Now, from here, look, Sam has assets left, but it is unfortunately going to be all over Bard the Shouting, because Sam has had to move into the midfield to contest space, and I still have just all of these Irregulars and Murder Pieces left. So this turn is going to be a very straightforward kind of attack. The Biker is going to Impetuous around into the Beta Trooper. It will go Dogged to the Nano Pulsar, but over that order and a subsequent um, Irregular order, it will kill the Beta Trooper. And then this Libertos on the rooftop will come around here, and it will put a Shotgun Template down over Shona Karano and the Sarko. And although it will take several orders, it will kill them both. And look, we don't really even need to do any more than that, because at that juncture, even though Sam has this Psychop left and this Millicent left, the um, the Mega Reaper Guard will kill the Varangian. Sam's in retreat, which means that even if I haven't killed his LT, it just doesn't matter. He just can't conceivably test any more ground. He's got no command tokens left. The army is just going to have to chill where they are. What we do do is sort of move forward. We try and press one more button. We try and uh, McMurray is going to end up jumping back up onto this rooftop and doing suspected infiltration classified on the Kappa before jumping back into the zone. But it's ultimately just, that's just for the sake of, hey, how many points could I score? The game is effectively done at this point. So at the end of the game, Sam has scored uh, one point from equalizing the score on the first turn. I've scored four from scoring two turns back to back with more zones. I have done my classified and I've pressed, I think, one or two buttons. I think it's been two buttons, uh, which puts me on seven points. So seven, one score to Dash Out Company in the end of the game. Uh, again, big thanks to Sam for the game today. It was very back and forth, ton of fun. I love playing against lists that are doing things I haven't seen before because it results in me making terrible mistakes, which I then have to recover from. And seeing that Beta Trooper link just clean sweep forward and just put a path of destruction through all of this stuff here was very, very cool. So again, big thanks to Sam for reaching out for a game as he travels down along the eastern seaboard to Albury. Border Bash is coming up very soon, Sam will be there, and I'm hoping to do an episode relatively soon showcasing some of the lists that have been submitted for Border Bash. So do keep an eye out for that. As always, big thanks to the channel supporters who make videos like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, you can do so via the Buy Me A Coffee link in the video description below, or by becoming a channel member. Big thanks to everyone who has so far. Coming up in the next few days, we will have that list showcase for Border Bash, and then after that, more faction focus and more battle reports to come. As always, I hope you enjoyed this, and I will see you next time.